You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. I want a hamburger, no a cheeseburger. I want a hot dog, I want a milkshake. And Big Anklevich. I want potatoes. You'll get nothing and I can... Down here it's better. Down here it's wetter. Take it from me. Welcome everybody to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. That's right. This <laughs> is episode 123. 123. 123. As easy as ABC. No, shoot. It's the other way around, I think. This is one of those uh, things like 12, 12, 12. 11, 11, 11, you know, you got those dates that everybody like wants to get married on or something like that. My sister got married on 7, 07, 07. Yeah. This is just like that, except for that it's episode one, two, three, a very special episode. Next on a very special episode of Blossom. Yeah. No, 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 no not that oh. kind of special episode. Oh, right. Not that special. <laughs> when we're Dudley's molested by the bicycle shop. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to bring those memories back to you. <laughs> well, we do have a story today, right? We do, yeah. It's, uh, it's a story that's been a long time, long time, long time come in. If you could say it's a lost episode. The story is Save the Date by Joe Zija. And since it's been... Oh, so long in coming. We're just going to go ahead and jump right into it. We're going to play that story for Joe. That's fair. But but before we do, who produced this story for us? Today's story was produced by Ken Crawford, who this is his first time producing on the Dune Steve. And his last. (laughs) We'll talk a little more about Ken and the production of the story later. Much later. Yeah, this story is actually quite a lengthy story. So we're going to jump right in. And don't forget about the author. Thank you, announcer man, keeping us on track. Uh, Joseph Zija is a budding author who has been writing ever since he was young. So he is no longer young? I guess not. (laughs) Starting with stories about adventures of him and his grade school friends, which were probably some of his better works, honestly. He continued to write casually on and off until about October 2010. At that point, he was still writing casually, but now he actually sent things to other people for them to read. Five months later, he's just finishing up his third novel, a fantasy called The Last Scion. Wait, I'm sorry. Five months from October 2010. I'm sorry, Joe. (laughs) And has published short stories in five different magazines all over the web and in print. He is enamored with storytelling and hopes to be a part of it for the rest of his days. He currently works and lives in Germany with his wife, Ariel. The human world, it's a mess. And his cat, Millie. Millie, the dog world, (laughs) it's a mess. Uh, I was hoping you would start singing thoroughly modern Millie songs. Apparently you're just not well versed in musicals. Oh well, on with the show. Save the Date by Joseph Zija. When her husband died, it left a void in Angela so great that she felt a terrible, nagging desire to fill it with whatever she could find. In fact, she ended up doing a great many things to try and fill that void. This was anything from playing cricket, playing croquet, baking croquettes, conversing about caddy codswallop, crocheting, and candle-making. And that was just the letter C. All thanks to the handy Encyclopedia of Grievous Distractions, given to her by her friend Doris at the repast. Her son Jacob, a 25-year-old with a bachelor's in English, had tried to voice his objection on the grounds that the word grievous was used incorrectly. But his mother patted him on the head and explained, like a patient schoolteacher, that since she was grieving... This was the perfect book for her. The real trouble began with the very last entry in the C section of the encyclopedia, calendar keeping. The author was not a native English speaker and had trouble alphabetizing. It read, 
go to the malls and finding a calendar with puppies or kitties or something else that is of pleasing to you. In this, keep you your dates of memories and moments precious and tender with great detail all of the times. Please be so very, very detailed and you will not think of things as you did before you started. With this, you will stop making memories of bad things and realize that you have good things also sometimes, maybe. A grievous distraction for you. And so it went, on and on, about the various details of calendar keeping and how to make it so engrossing that you couldn't even remember whatever horrific event caused you to buy the calendar or the encyclopedia in the first place. Angela, being a practiced neurotic obsessive compulsive with a penchant for the cute pictures on calendars, fell immediately in love with the idea. She embarked on a quest that very day, encyclopedia in hand for moral support, to the local mall and marched up to the calendar kiosk. A bored young woman dressed all in black with an astounding amount of makeup extended a friendly greeting by not making eye contact or saying anything at all. Young lady, I want to change my life today, Angela said, beaming. She was clutching the encyclopedia like it was the Bible. The woman in black looked up at her with no expression whatsoever, then looked back down at her cell phone and started pressing buttons. Angela cleared her throat, teetering forward on her toes and trying to beam brighter. Her cheeks strained from the effort. <clears throat> yeah, said the young woman, not looking up from her phone. I want to change my life today by buying one of your calendars. The woman in black sighed. She put her cell phone back in her lap. Okay, what kind of calendar are you looking for? We have kittens, puppies, motorcycles. Oh, no! Angela interrupted, patting the book she was clutching to her chest. I want something special. Something unique that, you know, speaks to me. But not literally talks, because those talking calendars can be kind of annoying, you know? And besides, the batteries die out so quickly, and you end up with this horrid thing on your wall that squelches out some robotic... robot talk every time you walk by. She paused for a moment, thinking hard. Oh, and a lot of writing space. I need lots of writing space. The kiosk lady's eyes twitched ever so slightly and she reached over to one of the racks. She snatched a small calendar and presented it to Angela with all the fanfare of washing one's hands. It read, Cleaning House, Memories of History's Greatest Janitors, and had a black-and-white photo of a grizzled old man holding a mop on the front cover. No, no, said Angela, her mouth still frozen in a smile. This isn't me at all. I want something in which I can write every detail of my life and my family's life and keep the memories forever. The young woman, mask of patience wavering for just a brief moment, reached across to another stand and produced a second calendar. This one read, Doing it right the first time, every time, at exactly the same time. The neurotic, obsessive compulsive's exactly 12 by 12, 12-month 12 calendar. To emphasize the point, two of the four sides of the front picture had wooden rulers taped to them and were included in the $11.32 price of the calendar. Don't worry, it comes out to $12 with a 6% sales tax. Angela looked at the calendar in her hand, then scrunched up her face as though someone, who smelled terrible, had told her a joke that she was struggling to comprehend. She handed the calendar back to the young woman in black. I don't understand, she said simply. Yeah, I'm sure, said the saleswoman. Don't you have anything special? She asked, trying again. My family means the world to me, and they deserve the best. Do you have a family? I know that's a silly question. Of course you have a family. But I was only wondering because you have a look like you don't really know your family. Or maybe you're being rebellious. Because you're just that right age, and that's what kids think is cool these days. But I'll bet that if you opened up a bit, your father would hug you once in a while, you know? The expressionless look on the saleswoman's face cracked. And for the first time in their conversation... Angela saw the woman in black smile. 
it wasn't a very nice smile at all. The edges of her lips curled upwards like fallen flower petals, and her eyes looked smoldering and seductive, skin slightly wrinkled at the edges. It was, at the very least, unnerving. Perhaps she had never had the opportunity to engage in such brilliant conversation with someone who was obviously very passionate about the art of calendar keeping. Yes, yes, she said, her voice low and sultry. I think I have something that would be perfect for you. Angela was starting to feel a little uncomfortable. She clutched the edges of the encyclopedia tightly. The young woman reached behind the cash register and fiddled with something. Angela heard a sound like the slow releasing of air from a tire, and a compartment on the side of the kiosk suddenly opened up, revealing a black box. Tiny tendrils of smoke crept out of the cracks, dancing in elaborate patterns as they rose to the ceiling of the mall. Although there appeared to be no hinges, locks, or clasps, the young woman, whose attention was now entirely on the box in front of her, simply pressed on the sides. The lid of the box popped upwards, and the saleswoman removed the lid, set it aside like one would set aside a piece of expensive china, and waited. Her hands hung in the air, trembling over the opening, and she chewed her lip in nervous anticipation. What she was waiting for, Angela could only guess. But looking at the smoke that was now pouring in small clouds from inside of the box, she thought maybe she was waiting for it to cool down. The smoke cleared, and with a barely audible gasp, the young woman cautiously reached inside. Angela braced herself. Something that inspired this much excitement in the calendar saleswoman must be of great import. Or at least have very sharp edges. The woman was chanting softly under her breath, and to the best of Angela's hearing, it sounded something like platypus soup. Perhaps the poor girl was hungry. She wasn't sure platypuses were edible, though. Finally, from the depths of the strange container, the young woman pulled out a flat, square object and put it on the table. The calendar. Angela thought it to be very anticlimactic. The calendar had a picture of a rolling field of flowers on the cover. In the very center, a little boy and girl were holding hands, the girl looking bashful and the boy looking just a little too serious, wearing a tuxedo. On the top of the calendar, in very unexciting lettering, it read, Tender memories, so you'll never forget. It was pleasant. Not overwhelmingly exciting, but pleasant. Like Angela. This is our finest calendar, the young woman said, still not taking her eyes off the counter. Is it used? Angela said, raising an eyebrow. Oh no, it's very new. In fact, it's almost like it was made just for you. It's not even shrink-wrapped. Inconsequential, the girl screeched, banging a pale fist against the counter. Angela jumped putting nail marks in the binding of the encyclopedia. The girl paused, panting a bit. After a moment, her voice was all silk. Besides, it's a real bargain. Angela did like bargains. The calendar was titled appropriately for what she was trying to do, and she didn't want the girl to shout again. She bought it straight away. As she turned to go home and show her son her new treasure... She thought she heard the young woman give a throaty chuckle behind her back. <laughs> Jacob sat at home at his computer with his face in his hands. He heard the garage door opening, which meant his mother was home from her shopping trip. She had probably found something in that damned book that Doris gave her and bought it. Since she had failed miserably at acupuncture, he had the scars to prove it, animal preservation bamboo carvings, and bonsai trimming, among other things. She must be on the seas by now. He wondered how many crossword puzzles or camels she bought. Being 25 and living with his mother wasn't easy, but he didn't have much of a choice. Jacob! Came a faint cry from the garage. He pretended not to hear it. Jacob! Now from the downstairs hallway. 
What, Mom? He said, taking his face out of his hands. You'll never believe what I bought at the mall today. She sounded happy. She was practically singing. Probably not, Mom. A calendar. A calendar? Why would she go all the way to the mall holding that ridiculous book only to buy something so mundane as a calendar? That's great, Mom. Come see. He searched his brain for some excuse why he couldn't. He had a column to write for work. He, he had pneumonia and it was contagious. His left leg had burst into flames. But all of these would only delay the inevitable. He'd have to go downstairs and try his best to share this moment with his mother. Why did his older sister have to run off and get married? If Kristen hadn't moved out, she would be an easy decoy while Jacob made his escape. Pushing back from his desk, he got up and walked downstairs like a man walking to the gallows. You have to see this calendar I bought at the mall from this dear young woman, she said when she saw him. She was very pretty. I think you would like her. I'm dating Sarah, Mom. We're engaged. I told you already. Oh, yes. What day was that? December 13th. I'll have to write it on the calendar as soon as I get settled. I think you're going to like it. It's right here on the table. She said it would be perfect for my family's most tender memories. Calendar keeping. That was it. That was the new distraction from that infernal encyclopedia. If he wasn't convinced that old Doris only had a few weeks, a month at best, left to live, he'd kill her. Jacob swore under his breath. <laughs> what was that? I said another trucker. I just saw one drive by a few minutes ago. And Would you look at that? There goes another one now. Oh. His mother said. Anyway, here it is. She produced a horrifically tacky wall calendar that had one of those sappy pictures of two children engaging in an innocent romance in a field of flowers. Jacob thought he tasted bile. Looks great, Mom. Where are you going to hang it? Oh, I think I'll hang it right here next to the fridge. That way I'll always remember to write in it every time something wonderful happens. And you know what's marvelous? It's January, so I get to use the calendar for the whole year. You always had great foresight, Mom. She smiled at him and gave him a big hug. She flipped open the calendar and tacked it to the wall next to the refrigerator. January's picture was of a similar pair of children to the one on the cover. These two were bundled up in snowsuits, posing for a photo with a sloppily constructed snowman. In flowing cursive below the name of the month, it read, Building New Friendships. Jacob couldn't help but roll his eyes. He was about to make a comment, but he heard his mom sniffling. <laughs> What's wrong? Oh, she said, wiping her nose on her arm. I just miss Harold, but I know he's in a better place now. She grabbed the pen and put her hand up to the calendar. Jacob's father had died on January 4th, just a few weeks ago. She wrote his death on the calendar. I know it's not a happy memory, but it's part of our family. I think it fits right in on our tender moments calendar. What do you think? Jacob opened his mouth to agree but stopped with his mouth open. Unless he was hallucinating, which, considering his recent lack of sleep and resultant caffeine addiction, was entirely possible. The calendar had just... moved. For a moment, it looked like the two children were viciously assaulting the snowman. One had a blood-stained shovel raised above his head. The other appeared to be holding a flamethrower. The snowman, whose carrot nose and eyes of coal were twisted in an expression of horror, was waving broomstick arms frantically as his body was split in half. In the blink of an eye, however, the two children were posing next to the snowman again, pink cheeks dimpled in innocent smiles once more. Jacob squinted and rubbed his eyes with his fists, then looked at the calendar again. The children were still smiling and the snowman was still intact. He had a funny feeling in the pit of his stomach. Yeah, Mom, but sure. Memories. I'm going to go upstairs. You go ahead and keep writing in your calendar. Okay, sweetie. 
Have fun. I'm making pot roast for dinner. Jacob turned and went upstairs, trying to decide if he really was losing it. Maybe a doctor would prescribe moving out, and his health insurance would pay for an apartment. Being a freelance writer sure wasn't. Angela picked up the pen again and walked over to the calendar. The pot roast in the oven was emitting a black smoke, but she just couldn't keep her mind off the calendar. She would walk over to it, pick up the pen, decide she had nothing to write, and then put it down. She repeated this process roughly every five minutes. And so far, it had caused a lot of ruined food in one small, yet not unmanageable, fire. Oh well, the wooden spoon could be replaced. Then she remembered that Jacob, when he was just over a year old, took his first step on January 17th. Giddy with delight at having discovered something to put on the calendar, she scribbled it in. She stepped back and surveyed her work. It looked wonderful. She smiled and sighed, feeling warm inside. This really was therapeutic. Jacob trudged upstairs, his head feeling fuzzy. In addition to the violent snowman mirage, he had been working on this ridiculous article on cat sweaters for a local pet store's catalog. It hurt his head, not to mention his pride and self-worth. Sitting down at his desk, he wiped the crust out of his eyes and put his hands on his keyboard. Nothing came out. He couldn't bring himself to write another trite word of this drivel. He found himself daydreaming about the day when he'd write something that people might actually read. A novel, perhaps, or maybe a steady column in the New York Times. A man could hope, couldn't he? Jacob stood up, unable to bear staring at the screen any more, and started to pace in his room. The cheap imitation Persian carpet on the center of his floor bore tread marks from many years of the same routine. As he walked back and forth, he closed his eyes and breathed deeply, a sort of meditative process that helped him forget about it all. Something slammed into his right foot. Opening his eyes and looking down, he noticed that he'd haphazardly left his trunk of old writing pieces in the middle of his floor and stubbed his toe on its edge. Frowning, he leaned over, rubbing it gingerly and muttering to himself. He could have sworn that he'd moved it this morning after filing away some of his paltry scribblings on nuclear physics effect on social dating constructs. Why hadn't those sold, anyway? He picked the trunk up and turned to put it back in the corner where it belonged. His only warning was a slight creaking noise. The next thing he knew, splinters of wood flew up from the floor, and he was eight inches shorter. The box of papers crashed down, spilling out a carpet of failure. Jacob collapsed, flailing arms and legs like a flying bunch of spaghetti. He hit the ground and heard a crunch, a monumental pain shooting up his right leg. Pulling his foot out of the hole in his floor, he knew instantly that it was broken, since he could scratch the back of his calf with his big toe. If the pain of trying didn't make him pass out, that is. He tried. It did. Poor Jacob, thought Angela as she flounced around her kitchen in her own particular manner of flouncing, dusting off the countertops. Who knew that floors could be so unpredictable? Since taking her son to the hospital, she hadn't had any time to think of what to write down in her calendar. Now that Jacob was upstairs and resting, she thought she'd take the opportunity to clean. Maybe it would help clear her mind. As she danced around the house, wielding a feather duster much like a fairy godmother might wield her wand, she sent up small clouds of dust. She came to a small set of shelves in the corner of the living room where she kept Jacob's old trophies. Despite his many protests about how he was all grown up and his sixth grade math league award wasn't going to get him published and so on, she carefully dusted off the pictures of him and his chess team, then moved on to some of his more distinguished award. High School Salutatorian, Louis Armstrong Award for Jazz Trombone, and first place in the High Rollers Bowling Tournament on February 16th, 1992. What a son she had. 
She stood in front of the case and sighed to herself, remembering the days of her and her husband praising their champion on these many occasions. She felt sadness grow inside of her. Many of these were without dates. She couldn't very well write, Sometime or another, Jacob won the such-and-such award across the center of March, and most of these were too far back for her to remember the specific day. Oh, well, she thought to herself. Bowling was important to him, too. I suppose I can write this down now and save these other ones for later. Skipping happily over to the calendar, she flipped the month to February. It was almost February anyway. February's picture on the top of the calendar was decorated to commemorate Valentine's Day, and streamers of red lace bordered a giant red cartoon heart. Inside the heart, a doe-eyed little girl and boy held hands, both looking away from each other embarrassed. The caption read, Young Love. Angela giggled. <laughs> they were adorable. Picking up the pen, she scribbled the victory at the bowling tournament in the space for February 16th. She put the pen down and surveyed the work. It looked fantastic. Angela felt something wet on her right hand. Looking at it, she saw a blotch of red liquid starting to run down her finger. Had she spilled some of her world-famous strawberry jam during her dusting frenzy? She hurriedly brought her hand to her mouth, licking it off to avoid messing up the recently cleaned white floor. It tasted stale and metallic. Oh dear, she thought, looking up at the picture again. I've gotten some on my calendar. She wiped another small blob away from the picture with a paper towel and went back to dusting, thinking that she'd better check the recipe next time she made that jam. After waking up in the hospital, being asked a series of inane questions about floorboard safety and walking habits, and finally being discharged with a restrictive cast and a bottle full of painkillers, Jacob arrived home. Hobbling up the stairs, he cast aside his crutches and all but fell into his desk chair, spinning around to the computer terminal. Despite his tenure in the hospital, his boss was unwilling to extend his deadline on the kitten sweater article. He'd have to finish it. Maybe it would end up easier to write while on strong medicine. At the very least, maybe he'd remember less of it when he was done. In fact, it seemed the medicine was working its magic already. Jacob swore he had just heard something moving in his room. As he was the only one in there, however, he knew it must have been his imagination or a delirium encouraged by the painkillers. Despite this knowledge, Jacob turned around. Nothing was out of place. He didn't see anything on the floor that shouldn't be there. His shelves were all neat and orderly, and there was nobody else in the room with him. He had a distinct feeling that something was missing, however, but he couldn't place it. He turned back around to his computer. A bowling pin was on the desk between him and his keyboard. That's what it was. The engraved bowling pin they had awarded him as a trophy for winning some menial tournament was missing from its shelf behind him. But now it wasn't missing at all. It was right here in front of him. The only problem was Jacob had no idea how it got there. He was fairly certain that it wasn't there just a moment ago when he was getting ready to type at his computer. And though the painkillers were a good scapegoat for these sorts of things... Something told him that he hadn't taken quite enough of them for animated bowling pins just yet. It growled. <sighs> Jacob cocked his head. No, that wasn't possible. It was a bowling pin. Something he had overlooked just a moment ago. Certainly it wasn't growling at him. It growled again. <sighs> this time louder like the sound of a Rottweiler warning an approaching stranger. Using his good foot, Jacob pushed his chair back. The bowling pin inched closer to the edge of the desk. Not taking his eyes off the object, he reached for his crutches, succeeding only in knocking them to the floor. His eyes widened. He was trapped. The bowling pin moved closer to the edge of the desk again. Another growl came from the pin, and this time, it was almost like it was speaking. Revenge, it sounded like. What? Jacob asked out loud. 
for the moment putting aside his disbelief that he was addressing a bowling pin. Revenge, it said, this time louder, in a hissing, drawn-out breath. I'm sorry, I I didn't know. I I mean, it was a long time ago. He was scrambling with his good foot, trying to scoot over to where his crutches had fallen on the floor. You know, we were just kids. They told me to throw the ball at you kids, do stupid things. You know, I'm... Revenge. The bowling pin floated up from the desk and turned sideways. A flash of white, and Jacob felt something hit him on the side of his head. Well... He found himself tumbling to the floor, the world suddenly going black, all the while vowing to throw out all his golf balls whenever he woke up. Several days later, when the hospital had released him for the second time, Jacob found himself in the kitchen with his mother. His foot was still in pain, and his head was throbbing. But that was the least of his problems. Despite all he tried to do to forget what had happened, he still had the issue of being attacked by a bowling pin. Jacob wasn't prone to fanciful daydreaming. He didn't even like reading books about fanciful daydreaming. He was as straight as an arrow, a pragmatist to the core, and lacked the imaginative capacity to come up with a story like that even if he'd wanted to. In short, he was boring. This, among other things, convinced him that there was no way that what he'd experienced was an illusion. His mother was tending to his wounds, like any mother would, with the tenderness of a nurse and the chattering of a monkey. Words flowed from her mouth like water from the Nile, but Jacob didn't hear any of them. He was too busy worrying about the other inanimate objects in the house that he might have offended. He had dropped the blender once when he was twelve, That could do some damage if it came at him at just the right angle. His mother had said something that made him perk up. What was that, Mom? I was saying that if you don't start being more careful, all I am going to have to write on my calendar is the dates of hospital visits. She was teasing him, of course, but something about what she had said bothered him, like an itch in the middle of his brain. It was that calendar again. He remembered the strange scene he had watched right before going upstairs and breaking his ankle. He could still see those violent children in his head and the poor defenseless snowman flailing his arms. It made him shudder. But he couldn't take his eyes off the calendar. February held another ridiculous picture coupled with an equally ridiculous subtitle about young love. He could see something written in the middle of the month. Something that looked like it was about bowling. Mom? He asked, his voice shaking just a little. What did you put on the calendar this month? Hmm? She responded. He'd interrupted her in the middle of chopping up some vegetables for soup. Oh, that. Remember that bowling tournament you won a long time ago? Well, I saw your trophy downstairs, and it had the date on it, so I thought I'd put it on the calendar. Isn't that precious? When did you write that? Oh, just a few days ago. (gasps) Jacob's mom gasped, putting her hand over her heart. Oh, dear. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Jacob asked, his mind working furiously. Of course I am. I forgot the chicken. She was in a tizzy now, looking through all the cupboards and all the shelves in the refrigerator. How can I make chicken soup with no chicken? I swear some days I think I'd forget my head if it wasn't attached to my body. She ran over to the counter and picked up her car keys. I'm going to the store. I'll be back in just a bit. You wait right there. Mom will take care of you. With that, she grabbed her jacket and was out the door. Jacob stared at the closed kitchen door, not quite sure if his bludgeoning wound was the cause of his headache anymore. He grabbed his crutches and hobbled over to the calendar. He was interested in what else was written in the creepy thing. He flipped through it, but didn't find anything. Apparently his mom hadn't been putting as much stuff in here as he thought. When he got to January, however, he noticed something. Jacob's first step, it read. Could there be a connection? She wrote his first step in the calendar, and he broke his foot. She wrote his bowling victory, and he was mauled by a bowling pin. It seemed too bizarre, 
There was also something written on the 4th of January. Before he could read it, a sound from the backyard made him turn around. It sounded like a very weak lawnmower motor far away, but there was something melodic to it that didn't sound like machinery. What the hell is that? Jacob said to himself, turning around. The sound came again. It was definitely a person in his backyard making noises similar to when you're at the doctor's office, and he asks you to open your mouth and say, Ah! Except he was doing it over and over again. Uh, uh, uh. Came the voice from the backyard. Jacob tried to get away, but his damned crutches were a terribly slow means of conveyance. Someone was coming toward his kitchen door. Uh. Came the sound again, then cut off abruptly. Jacob froze, not knowing what to do, staring at the back door. The doorknob moved, but the door didn't open. At least his mom had the sense to lock the back door. Jacob heard a sliding noise, then heard something jiggling the lock. The bolt slid open, the doorknob turned, out swung the door. Goddamn hide a key, he thought. In the doorframe stood a creature that was only human in the remotest sense of the word. He stood... Jacob assumed it was a man because of the dapper suit he was wearing, holding both hands out in front of him like he wasn't able to balance himself properly. Flesh hung from his bones, and his right eye had all of the skin around it cut away, revealing the bone of the eye socket. His lips were all but gone, thin lines above and below his mouth accentuating yellowed teeth. He was hideous. Yet... Something about him was familiar. Then, with a high, squeaky voice that Jacob could barely hear over the beating of his own heart, Jacob spoke. Dad? Just a few minutes later, Jacob and his father Harold were sitting down at the kitchen table, a fresh pot of coffee on the stove, and two steaming mugs in front of them. His dad picked up his cup, put it to his lips, and took a long sip. The hot liquid flowed over what remained of his tongue and immediately poured out a hole in the back of his neck, dripping onto the floor behind him. It was a frivolous gesture, but his father insisted that it was necessary. I can't believe they don't have coffee on the other side, Jacob said. Neither can I, responded his father. Would you believe they don't have cable either? Do you have any idea how strange it is to be in the afterlife, trying to twist a pair of old rabbit ears to catch the news? He took another sip. Ah, this is great. You'd think after a couple thousand years they'd have figured that out, said Jacob. A couple hundred thousand, his father said. Death's been around forever, son. Forever. Harold's voice sounded much like a radio station that was barely coming in. You could expect that, he explained when Jacob asked, when your vocal cords were deteriorating. Despite his creepy appearance, Harold had only been dead for a month or so now, so he'd lost just enough to make him very clearly dead, but not enough to make him a skeleton. Jacob found his father very easy to talk to. Jacob learned a thing or two about the other side, the difference between heaven and hell, eternal redemption and eternal punishment, and so on. General mysteries that had plagued the minds of theologians and philosophers for all time, and now he had all, or at least most of, the answers. Boy, were they going to be upset when they heard what he had to say about all that bunk. He made a mental note to at least put it on the internet later. But I don't understand how you came back. Oh, that, said his father. That's all your mother's fault. What, the power of love? asked Jacob. Harold scoffed. No, my boy, the power of bitterness and impatience. He pointed to the calendar hanging from the wall. That thing right there is cursed. I knew it! cried Jacob, standing up only to be reminded that his right foot had been broken. <laughs> Whimpering with pain, he collapsed back on the chair. Mom wrote down the date of my first step right before I broke my foot. 
And, and she wrote down the date of my bowling championship on the same day I was attacked by a bowling pin. A what? It's a long story. The point is, every time she wrote something down on that thing, something almost the opposite has happened. But hang on, Dad. Mom wrote down the day of your death almost a month ago when she bought the calendar, and you only just came back. <laughs> oh, no, I came back a month ago. But you people decided to bury me in Cadiston, a full 30 miles away. Who the hell do we know in Cadiston that you decided to throw me there? Free plot. Gee, thanks. Anyway, since you didn't bury me with a driver's license and a major credit card, I couldn't exactly rent a car to come back here. You ever try to hitchhike on Route 72 with half your face hanging off? Jacob shrugged. I would think you'd fit in well with a hitchhiking crowd. Oh, shut up. The point is, I'm here now, and when this is all over, I want you to bury me in the backyard. Fine, Dad. Whatever you want. But we need to do something about that calendar. Jacob stood up and hobbled over to the wall. He flipped to December again, looking to see if there were any clues to the calendar's origin, and froze. December 13th, it read. Jacob and Sarah get engaged. Great. I can hear the breakup call already. I haven't heard from Sarah in a while. Now I know why. As if on cue, the phone rang. Sighing, Jacob picked up the phone and answered expecting the I'm-dumping-you conversation to kick off right away. Hello? Uh, yes, this is Jacob. Oh, hi, Mr. Fuchs. Uh, no, I haven't heard from Sarah in a while. Why? Jacob paused. He asked Sarah's dad to repeat the information. He paused again. What do you mean she exploded? Yes, I understand the basic principles of physics. No, I'm not mocking you. No, we were not playing with military-grade weapons. Jacob listened for a moment longer to the details, then dropped the phone. It hung, swinging back and forth from the wall. He sunk to the floor, ignoring the pain in his foot. Sarah was dead. The girl he was going to marry was dead. Thoroughly, irreplaceably dead. He would never see her again. All because of that calendar! Harold shrugged and took another sip of his coffee, further dirtying the floor behind him. See? Cursed. The drive to the mall was frantic. Jacob knew that his mom had bought the calendar at the kiosk, but his right foot was still broken and his father's was partially deteriorated, not to mention a nasty case of rigor mortis. So they careened along the highway, Jacob driving with an untrained left foot and wearing a goofy baseball cap. Luckily, the worst of it was a near-miss incident with a very lucky squirrel. With all of the speed of a crippled young man with a head injury and a half-dead father, they burst into the mall and sought out the calendar kiosk. A bored young woman dressed all in black with an astounding amount of makeup extended a friendly greeting by not making eye contact or saying anything at all. Jacob and his father who had adopted the official mall rat camouflage of a loose hooded sweatshirt and baseball cap, approached the woman. Jacob, just a little stressed, spoke first. What the hell? He shouted, banging his fist on the counter. People all around the kiosk turned their heads. Mothers covered their children's ears and ushered them along to the toy store. The mall security guard, knowing full well that he would be unable to do anything should an incident actually occur, tugged very officially on the brim of his hat and walked away. The woman at the counter dropped her cell phone. It hit the ground and shattered, bits of plastic flying in every direction. Did I get your attention? Asked Jacob, finding himself in a sort of blind rage that was unfamiliar and frightening, yet quite refreshing. Good! My mother came here a month ago and bought a calendar from you. Tender moments. Do you remember it? At the mention of the calendar, the woman in black paled, which is to say she became nearly transparent. She nodded. Yes, I can see that you do. Since then, every time she's written something in it, something bad has happened to me. Hey, remarked his father, who had been standing silently behind him. Something bad has happened to someone, he corrected. But most often me. And I will swear until my dying day that there are snowmen murdering children inside that thing. The woman's mouth was moving, but no sound was coming out. Jacob kept going. And you know what else? 
I tried to take it off the wall to, to bring it back over here and show you, and it set my hair on fire. Jacob took off his hat, exposing a half head of hair that looked somewhat like a mole-infested lawn during a summer drought. That had been a very painful couple of seconds, giving him a great appreciation for sinks with spray nozzles. Jacob stared at the woman, who seemed too shocked to respond. After a few moments, she said, I, I, I don't understand. That makes two of us, said Jacob. Hey, came a voice behind him. Three of us. Sheesh, mumbled his father. Ever heard of the expression, gone but not forgotten? Jacob ignored his father. What, he asked the woman, is it exactly that you don't understand? Well, it wasn't supposed to be that bad, she said, regaining some of her color. You mean you did this yourself? Jacob raised an eyebrow. Of course I did this. I'm a witch. It's what I do. Besides, have you ever had a conversation with your mother? Jacob and his father exchanged knowing looks. But it was only supposed to be cursed a little bit, you know. How do you curse something a little bit? Asked Jacob's father. Well, you know, someone writes down the day they get a new job and suddenly they lose a hundred dollar bill. Someone writes down that they met a girl and a new hunk of a man mysteriously appears in her life. They write down an appointment and they get a flat tire on the way. That kind of stuff. Jacob, eyes wide with fury, leaned over the counter and spoke very slowly. My mother wrote down that my girlfriend and I got engaged. And my fiancé exploded. Uh, she what? Exploded! As in, she is no more. She is fragments on the wall of my no longer future father-in-law's living room. Human wallpaper. Nothing left to bury. Do you understand now? Hold on a second. She said, holding up a hand. She picked up the desk phone. Hi, Molly. It's Jennifer. Yeah, great. Whatever. Look, you know that Tender Memories calendar? Yeah, that one. Did you do anything to it? The box? Seriously, who curses a box? Did you know the calendar was already cursed? There was a moment of silence as the woman on the other end delivered some information. <sighs> oh no, nothing wrong. You just caused a woman to explode. She hung up the phone. It was a double curse. I cursed the calendar and the other witch that works and I cursed the box, so it made everything worse. Really sorry about all this. Would you like a refund? Jacob stared at her. Oh, alright. I can come remove the curse for you. My boss is going to kill me. You might want to call your mom and have her not write anything else down in the meantime. That's right, said Jacob. She'll be home any minute now. Dad, give me your cell phone. Did you bury me with one? Right. Give me that one there, then. He pointed at the one behind the counter. His mom picked up. Hello? Mom, it's Jacob. Oh, hi. I was wondering where you went. Listen, I... Mom, for once in your life, stop talking and listen to me. You know that calendar you bought? It's cursed. Every time you write something in it, something opposite happens. Something really bad. It's why my foot fell through the floor and why I got attacked by a bowling pin. Oh, Jacob, that's ridiculous. You didn't get attacked by a bowling pin. And it's just a calendar. You're so silly. Are you sure you're feeling okay? Mom, you need to listen. Hush! You come home right now and eat some of the soup. It's almost ready. And you know what I was thinking of while I was at the store? I had forgotten to write down your birthday. Honestly, sometimes I think I'd forget my head if it wasn't attached to my body. See you soon, sweetie. Click. Jacob felt all of the blood drain from his face. What'd she say? Asked his father. That I have a few minutes left to live. Let's go. Trees flew by at over a hundred miles an hour. It wasn't so bad using your left foot if you had no intention of using your brakes. Did you really get attacked by a bowling pin? Came a voice from the back seat. I will kill you, Jacob said. They rode the rest of the way in silence. Jacob hoped the sound of the mailbox being catapulted across the lawn would distract his mother as he screeched into the driveway. Heart pounding, he ran... Well, he hobbled exceptionally fast, out of the car and in through the front door. Mom! He yelled. In the kitchen! Came the reply. He burst through the kitchen door. His mom was at the stove, stirring the large pot of soup, humming to herself softly. Jacob went up to her, breathing heavily. 
Did you already do it? He asked, bracing himself for the response. Almost. She said, and Jacob felt a naive part of himself breathe a sigh of relief. Give me another five minutes and the soup will be done. No! The calendar! Did you write my birthday in the calendar? His mom turned around and looked at him, looking both concerned and confused. Of course I did, honey. I told you on the phone that's what I was going to do, didn't I? You poor thing. You've had such a tough time. She patted him affectionately on the cheek and turned back around to the stove. The other two came through the kitchen door moments later, just in time to see Jacob sink to his knees on the floor, ignoring the pain in his ankle. It didn't matter now anyway. Oh, no, 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 no. He chanted, his face in his hands. Why did you do it, Mom? I told you, the calendar cursed! No, no, no. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jacob, don't be... Jacob's mom turned around and noticed the new figures in the kitchen. Oh, hello. Jacob didn't say we would be having guests. Well, there should be plenty of soup for everyone. Jacob, get up off the floor this instant. Mind your manners. Jacob, for reasons he didn't understand, took his crutches and got up. He looked at Jennifer, the black-clothed calendar saleswoman. The calendar's on the wall there, he pointed. Hurry! She already wrote my birthday down. I don't know how much time I have left. Hurry! Jennifer moved over to the wall, looking surprisingly nonchalant. That's when he saw them. Outside the kitchen window were several hundred dark-skinned men standing in a perfectly straight line on his backyard lawn. Each of them had white paint all over their faces in differing shapes and patterns. All of them held a spear at the ready. Dark, rippling muscles stretched their tanned skins taut, and the lone loincloth they each wore left very little to the imagination. They were standing still, but Jacob could have sworn that he heard a low-pitched chanting coming from outside. Are those... Aztecs? He said with an understandable degree of incredulity. Uh, Mayans, probably. Said Jennifer, who was staring at the calendar on the wall with a pondering expression on her face, tapping her lips softly. They're more mystical, I think. They're here to kill me, aren't they? Oh... Yeah, probably. You did say the calendar was having overly dramatic effects, yes? Jennifer was running her hand over the pages of the calendar. I think I can take care of this in just a few minutes. Jacob's mom turned around from the pot again. She was still humming. So, she said, four for dinner then? You can all take a seat. Maybe if you lie down on the floor, suggested Jacob's father, they won't see you. Jacob's mom cocked her head, trying to see under his father's baseball cap. You look familiar. Have we met? Jacob couldn't sink down to the floor. He couldn't move. He could only stare at the window at the row of Mayan warriors who were preparing to execute him. The chanting was still coming through the window, a steady, low note that he could feel deep in his chest. Then it stopped and there was nothing left but the soft humming of Jacob's mom, who had turned back to the stove and was still stirring the pot, adding salt. Jennifer was now muttering softly under her breath, with her hand on the calendar. Jacob's dad was pouring himself a cup of coffee. The Mayan horde began marching toward the house in perfect unison, beating the butts of their spears against the ground in rhythm with their steps. Jacob's death parade. It caused a terrible din, and made the few dozen of them sound more like hundreds. Jacob's stomach was somewhere in between his heart and his throat, and he knew he should be trying desperately to get away. But there was no point. It was already on the calendar. He would die today. Besides... Crutches would only make him look silly as he tried to get away from dozens of trained ancient warriors. At least he could meet a violent, pointy end with some dignity. Behind him, he heard Jennifer gasp. He whirled around and saw her hand stuck to the calendar, with a white light coming from its center. Wide-eyed, she kept muttering whatever witches mutter when they get their hands stuck to enchanted calendars. 
leaves. The Mayans were getting closer, not 50 feet from the window. He could now see their eyes, cool, calculated, like they were on the way to the store to pick up some milk. Jacob knew how milk felt now. Jennifer was muttering louder now, and it was coming out more like chanting. Jacob couldn't understand the words. Was it platypus soup? But he hoped they translated to something like, Oh, witch-like spirits, please destroy this calendar and banish the Mayans, etc. Crash! A spear flew through the kitchen window and stuck to the wall beside the calendar. Jacob crouched down involuntarily, but Jennifer was so engrossed in what she was doing that she barely noticed. The same went for Jacob's mom. When she got involved in soup, she really got involved in soup. Thunk! Another spear hit the wall. Jacob crouched on the floor now, whimpering. To hell with dignity. He looked up to see a Mayan using the butt of his spear to clear away broken glass from the window. The doorknob on the back door was jiggling. One of them was trying to open it from the outside. The glow of the calendar was becoming very bright, reflecting off the smooth surface of the floor. Long, dark legs crept up over the window sill. They were coming in. In just a few seconds, Jacob knew he would be a Mayan kebab. A whistling noise, like steam coming out of a thousand tea kettles at once, erupted behind him from the direction of the calendar. Jacob was now huddled on the floor, covering his ears with his hands. The Mayan was through the window now and advancing on him. The kitchen door crashed open, splintering along the hinges, and a flood of dark-skinned spearmen came rushing inside, ululating in wild, high-pitched cries, their bare feet slapping against the linoleum of the kitchen floor. Turn that music down, will you, dear? said his mom. He closed his eyes and waited. This was it. Silence. Jacob wasn't sure if he was dead. He hadn't felt anything. He hadn't even really heard anything. And now there was silence. No more shrieking ancient warriors. No more whistling calendars or muttering saleswoman witches. Cautiously, knowing he really should probably just stay still and keep his eyes closed for the rest of his life, he looked upwards. Six men were standing around him, the spears held high above their heads. They suddenly dropped their arms, however, and their faces took on the expression of children who approached the gates of an amusement park only to find it was closed for renovations. One of them even stomped his foot and threw his spear to the ground. Slowly, reluctantly, they turned and filed out of the kitchen door, muttering in a strange language. The one that came through the window opted for uniformity and decided to go out through the window as well, causing the last few flecks of broken glass to clink to the floor. They left the kitchen door swinging lazily on its broken hinges and vanished. Standing slowly, Jacob turned around. Where the calendar had been on the wall, there was now a large black burn mark. Jennifer was standing with her arms folded and a self-satisfied smile on her face. His mom was finishing pouring the last bowl of soup, and his father was still sipping his coffee. You'll want to put that mug down, Jennifer said, looking at Jacob's father. Why? Oh, I see. He put the mug on the table. Well, when you come to visit, and you'll all come sooner or later, bring coffee with you, all right? Be good. He looked up at an angle into the distance. Ah, the light was much brighter the first time around. Dying sure gets old fast. With that, Jacob's father deteriorated into a pile of dust with a whoosh noise. His hat and sweatshirt fell gently atop the pile of sand on the floor. Jacob's mother turned around holding two bowls of soup. Only three for dinner? What happened to the familiar-looking boy? And who tracked in all of this dirt? She clicked her tongue in disapproval and put the two bowls on the table, then turned around to fix her own. Jacob turned to Jennifer. What about Sarah? Will she get pieced back together? Jennifer shrugged. <sighs> Who knows? Fixing things isn't exactly my area of expertise. Sorry about all this, by the way. Some mistake could have happened to anyone. Just promise me you won't curse things anymore, Jacob said, picking up his crutches from the floor. 
Oh, come on. I'm a witch. It's what we do. Well, said Jacob, at least promise to coordinate your cursing from now on. You know, use post-it notes or something that say, caution, already bewitched. I'll see what I can do. Mind if I keep the spear? She pointed to the deadly-looking spear that the disappointed Mayan had cast to the floor. Jacob shrugged. Thanks, she said. If you ever need a calendar, you know where to find me. Get out. Waving her hand dismissively, Jennifer left. Jacob's mom turned around again, a third bowl in her hand, and harumphed. Why do these people keep disappearing? Jacob, you need to make more dependable friends. Jacob looked around at the smoking hole in the wall, the broken kitchen window, the dirty footprints on the floor, and the broken door to the backyard. Limping over the pile of dust, he scooped up as much of it as he could carry and walked over to the now empty door frame to the backyard. I'll be right back. Author's Note Save the Date was originally written for a Pill Hill Press anthology called Wretched Moments. It was a play on the Precious Moments figurines and their goopy, sort of creepy way of capturing life's most tender memories. The goal was to write a piece that glorified life's worst moments instead. I got the idea for my story for my mom, actually whose name is Angela, though I promise you she's nothing like the Angela in the story. We're a sarcastic, abrasive family from New Jersey, and when I was a young kid, I'd run up to her to tell her some meaningless achievement or other. Mom, I'd say, I saw deer poop in the woods. Thanks, Joey, she'd say. I'll put that on my precious moments calendar right away. So when I read the anthology call, I thought, what if there was a calendar that, when you were to write something on it, something bad were to happen? Really bad. And so Save the Date was born. This is actually the first place it's been published. By the time I was done with it, it had changed into the bizarre, urban fantasy, dark humor story I have now, so I really wasn't surprised when Pill Hill Press said it wasn't for them. But I do hope it was for you. All right, welcome back, folks. That wonderful story. A full 58 minutes and change. That's not a record, is it? No, it's not a record. Is it a record for 2012? I'm sure it is. All right. It's, what, the second episode of 2012? So... Easy to do. Spoilers. Oh, wait. Is that a spoiler? Really? Wow. Hey, uh, after the story? Uh. No. <laughs> after the story, the cast list. <sighs> okay. So. You read the story. I know that was your voice. That's right. That was my voice. I was the narrator. And Jacob, the, uh. The shirtless werewolf boy. <laughs> right. Whose voice hasn't hit puberty yet. That's right. Yes, that one. No, the other one. Uh, Jacob, the son, was played by Rich Outfield. Angela, the mom, was played by Renee Chambliss. Harold, the I dad. Bet. <laughs> Harold was played by Ryan Stevenson. Any relation to Ryan E. Stevenson? Uh, I think, yes. The famous Dutch author. <laughs> <laughs> the same person, actually. Yeah, he, he played the zombie dad. We prefer the term unliving. Ah, okay. Don't use the Z word. That does seem more uh, politically correct. Jennifer the Kiosk Witch was played by Cheyenne Amaro. And yeah, the rest of the voices were done by us. Well, but who did the music? The music was by Ken Crawford, producer of the show. Well, that's unique. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? It is. That, oh boy, poor Ken Crawford. <laughs> he, uh, this is a posthumous release. The poor man died of old age. He's quite a young man, but... Yeah, it's an unfortunate thing. You know, sometimes things like that happen. This seemed to be one of those episodes. Maybe it was because it was about a cursed calendar. The episode itself was cursed as well. I don't know. We'll do a broken mirror story about a cursed podcast. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, this was this was one of those... Well, can you give me a couple examples of things that befell the poor bastard? Uh, well, the, the good man. <laughs> Here and there, I'd send him an email and I'd say, hey, how's that story coming? And he'd be like, oh, you know, you could you could tell. It was like the tone of the email 
was kind of like the the tone you might get of like the guy on the phone who's calling the plumber while his floor is like half filled with water. He's got a plunger in his hand trying to, you know, make it the toilet stop overflowing, but it's the the level is rising. That kind of panicked, ah, pulling his hair out kind of tone. But each time be like, oh, you know, I'm I'm going to have it to you this weekend. And then another thing would go wrong. The last time that I asked him, he says, well, I loaded the production last night to do the final run through and somehow his computer got confused and just like fused all the audio a la the fly from the movie where the fly and the man were spliced together in one and so the audio would the second half and the first half were put over the top of each other so you'd be hearing them both at the same time just crazy stuff like that weird stuff there's no understanding why that would happen aside from the fact that it's a cursed podcast yeah i think the worst part was when he found the podcast and it was in a spider's web and he was going it was really that's that was upsetting to hear that was that poor little mp3 screaming help me uh but yeah he said he's never had so many problems with the production in his life and he he did an entire novel he wrote a novel read the novel edited the novel and had less problems and got it done in less time than this one short story so uh well, see, now we're going to hear of people whose iPods crash when they down, when they start listening to this story. <laughs> people who, you know, they're listening to it in their car and they, they, they lose control and crash through a bunch of nuns or school children, <laughs> you know, things like that. They're, they're yeah, listening on a plane and, well. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, you never know. If you are listening to this on a plane, turn it off now while you still can. Maybe too late already because this is after the story after all when when ken told me this last time he's like yeah you know it's my fourth time re-editing this story it's a good story but i'm sure sick of it and uh, the good thing was though he says that he can just edit it in his sleep he's, he's done it so many times that he already has memorized where the in and out points need to go and the cuts need to be made so uh sorry for all the trouble it has been for you ken i hope you s- still got some kind of enjoyment out of it And sorry to poor Joe, who was so excited to have sold his story to a podcast. And Uh, now Pulitzer Prize winning Joseph Z. Those those novels that he's written have already come, sold millions of copies. And he's just like, oh, why did I give those guys the rights to my story? I could be getting big money for it now. Gosh, I think it was probably sometime in the middle of last year that he sent us that story to begin with. We were just looking uh, when we were getting his author's note out. He had us his author's note before February of last year was over. It's been almost a full year since just his author's note was here, much less the submission of the story. I know that's happened a few times before, but I always feel so bad when something like that happens, that someone is waiting a year for the story to come out on our show and that's why this is our final episode, folks. We, we would hate for another author to suffer in that way. You're listening to the final episode of the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And may I add, it's about bloody time. You know, the things, you know, they're out of our control, so there's nothing that we can do to keep them from happening. But uh, definitely accept our apologies for the extremely long wait, Joe, because, you know, we really enjoyed your story. I mean, that's the whole point of having it in the first place on the shows because we liked it and we didn't buy it from you just to make you suffer. (laughs) You would have thought. (laughs) Yeah, you would think from the way this went, but we really did it because we really enjoyed the story. We found it very funny and we just loved the tone and the um, just the general snideness of the whole thing really floated our boat. Yeah, I've always loved... And you've read some of my stuff. I love stories about cursed objects or people that have curses on them, you know, that kind of thing, or just a string of bad luck or I don't know. There's something about that that, that's always really amused me or, or fascinated me. But I don't know that I've ever written a story with this kind of attitude about a cursed object. It was so farcical and so over the top silly that you couldn't take it all that Seriously, I mean, I, I, if you described somebody this story, it would sound like a horror story. 
You know what I mean? Uh You tell them what happens when the calendar is used. They'd be like, ooh, creepy. But it's, but it's not. It's, it's. I loved how you'd take it another step forward. But yeah, I love the part where they're, they're trying to go back to the calendar shop at the mall and uh, put things right. And uh, he skips ahead to where they're driving in the car. And for some reason, the son Jacob has got uh, a hat on. He mentions that he had to put a hat on, but they don't really say why until later on where he says, I tried to take the calendar off the wall and it set my hair on fire. (laughs) Each time it just gets a little worse. Uh, Although, you know, if you describe the story to somebody, when you get to the part where the bowling pin attacks the guy, that's going to, I think, give them an idea of the tone of the story because that doesn't sound so much like a horror story as a farce. Okay. (laughs) So there is that one. It was fun. Yeah, I liked how they uh, took it another level every time, uh, you know, until when she writes his birthday on the calendar and he comes home. And there's a regiment of Mayan warriors outside <laughs> waiting to kill him. You know, that... that. Uh... So what I was saying a minute ago about cursed objects and the stories that I write, mm-hmm. my stories tend to be a lot more serious. Right. And uh, when he mentioned in the author's note, the, was it Pill Hill Press collection or whatever, and they didn't accept his story... Uh, they were missing out, by the way. <laughs> Maybe it's because they wanted to do stories like the kinds I write, where things go horribly bad and they don't get better. There's no happy ending kind of thing. And it's Boy, dark it's just... and sad and dreary. And But, uh, I, yeah, if it, were, if it were my anthology, I would want a story in here where they take it with maybe, uh, not a grain of salt, but they take it with... A spoonful of sugar? No, they just, <laughs> they wink about it. You know, they take it in a dark place, but they smile the whole yeah, journey. They, and they're I, sarcastic and, and witty about it the whole way through, which made, that's what made the story really fun. If it were just the same story, but without the, uh, the jokes all the way through it and the sarcasm and so forth, I think it would have been much less of a story for it. And we it may not have been for us. Hmm. whereas it wasn't for pill hill press the way it was yeah it may have been that way i think that's what really made it stand out for us and made it something that we wanted to keep yeah it's it's amazing that it's so much time has passed they've already made a movie out of save the date uh, anthony hopkins plays jacob you know I, I don't know that i would have chosen him as the son yeah he might have been better as uh, as the dad the zombie dad but uh strangely they cast uh Rupert Grint is that, which was another odd casting. Is <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. You know, it's funny that I remember our one of our probably our second broken mirror that we ever did together was one of those cursed objects. You wrote me up and said, "Okay, a guy has a revenge crystal, but he finds out that it works all too well." And yeah, we went and took that and made stories out of it. And uh, maybe someday we'll share those with you. Oh but, uh, hell no, Big Anklevich. Uh, and I'm sure I've read at least 10 stories of yours that have to happen to be about cursed or sometimes blessed items. There was one about a bathroom that was quite blessed. Oh, that's true. <laughs> and just, people wanted to go to this bathroom. What was it that Abby would always call that? Magical, Magical real- realism. realism. I had never heard that term before, but I guess that's what it is. And I, I really like that. A story that takes place in our world, but... That's, something is off. Something uh, small. But that's a pretty standard. I mean, you see a lot of movies that are that way. Things that were, you know, there's something like that uh, that happens. And this story, it was exactly down that alley, Avenue, Street. Where you at. Fair. It's uh, just like that. You got to, everything is normal, except for there's a calendar, which has caused some crazy crap to happen. And uh, that's that's one of those things that I really like to write, too, is just... Uh, there's something about something that's set in today's day, except for this is the difference. Sometimes that really interests me. You know, there's been a couple ideas where I'm just like, oh, what if these people had magic? And, you know, there's just these couple of people. What would it be like if there were two people in the world that were able to do so much magic that they would be like superheroes or something? What would happen? What would they do? What would the world be like? Uh, well, see, that doesn't seem like 
that sort of story. That seems like a much more epic fantasy story rather than whatever magical realism is. I, I mean, I, I, one time I was at, at El Taco and a woman went into the bathroom and, uh, you know, Never I just came I, out. That's exactly it. I didn't see her come out, and it occurred to me of what if there was a bathroom where people would go in and they never came out, and they, they and, checked in, but they didn't check out. And I wrote a story about it. Yeah, I've read it, that one too. Yeah, a, a good bathroom and an evil bathroom, I and mean, they're probably really in go. the same neighborhood. <laughs> but and they, everybody gets inspiration or ideas for stories from a different source, and I love the idea that his mom would say that she was going to write in her calendar just the worthless crap that the kid said uh, that my mom is totally not sarcastic and she's sincere all the time. And it's just funny that his mom wouldn't be like that. Rish's mom actually said, Oh, that's very nice dear. Look, I'm writing it in my calendar now. You know, the funny thing is writing that kind of crap down. So awesome. Seriously, because 10 years later, you're not going to remember that your kid felt it to be worthwhile to come and say, guess what, mom? I saw a deer poop in the woods today. Or, you know, kids say some of the weirdest crap sometimes. My grandma used to do that with my dad. Um, he would say just weird stuff sometimes. And she's like, oh, my gosh. And she would write it down on any scrap of paper she had nearby. You know, she asked my dad, hey, what do you want for your birthday this year? And he's like, I want a hammer and a saw. Why do you want a hammer and a saw? Well, that way, if a dog attacked me, I could hit it in the head with a hammer and then I could saw its head off so it couldn't bite me. It's like, what? What kind of a weird thing to say is that? Your and dad this... told you that <laughs> while on death row through one of those prison telephone. <laughs> and yeah, this is, you know, a five-year-old just saying weird stuff. And yeah, my grandma loved to write that stuff down whenever he would say that. And since they've told me about those stories, the need to write those kind of things is kind of passed down on me and I keep a pretty good record now of things like that of what my kids say when they say weird stuff or do weird stuff and just also what we go out and do and have fun and you know those are the kind of things that you don't re I don't remember things that I said about myself because nobody wrote them down and remembered to tell me later and I know that my dad kind of remembers things but i know that he doesn't i mean just the other night he was here he was talking about something he said oh yeah he was just like this from you know before he could even talk he already loved this and i was just like no i know that that's not true because i remember when i first started loving that particular thing and it wasn't when i was as little as that you know your memory is going to be faulty and those things are going to go away if you don't write them down I wish that I'd actually done that from all the way back when my kids were first born. Unfortunately, I didn't think to start doing it until several years later. So there's a lot of things that I missed in the interim. And it's hard to just go back and recreate them. <laughs> if only you had a second chance, another chance to raise a kid. An opportunity uh, to get things right. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I guess there's something to that. I don't know that writing on a calendar is necessarily the way to go. What I've done it with is a blog, which is handy because on top of the fact that, you know, I can share it with grandparents that don't live in the area. Also, then all your stuff is saved somewhere in the cloud. So if your computer crashes, which mine has done, you don't lose it. Uh, that's a good thing. It's crazy how fast you'll forget things totally things that you have blogged about and you forgot that they ever happened to you and I, I remember there was the day that i met neil patrick harris and put it in my blog and a few years later we were talking and said hey you know neil patrick harris came out of the closet and announced everybody he's gay and i was like oh well, that's interesting i'd never really you know I just, and you said no i think in your blog you mentioned that people always said he's gay but you knew that he wasn't and i was like what and we looked and it, and I, there was an entry from like 2003 or 4 where i said people are always saying that neil patrick harris is gay but i met him today and he was with a really hot chick and i know he isn't <laughs> it's funny because gay guys never hang out with hot chicks that just doesn't happen <laughs> okay bad example like 
<laughs> I'm just that was the yeah, first one that came to my mind. It's totally that way. You totally forget those things. I've so, forgotten that I'd even met him, man. Yeah, it's, recording things like that. It's 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 worthwhile. I mean, it's maybe it's not for you. It's not something that's for everybody. But uh, I bet if your father were to suddenly appear and pull out a book and say, "Here's a book of all the things that you did when you were a kid." And they handed that over to you and it had all these things written in there, pictures and stuff to go along with it and et cetera. You'd just freak out at how awesome that would be. I would. I mean, shoot, I'm lucky to have, there's like maybe 30 minutes of video of me from my whole life that I didn't take myself, you know? That kind of stuff is really interesting to me because it it, there's not a lot of it in existence. So maybe if you just had tons and tons of... Oops, oh, yeah, thanks for another book, Dad. Did you have anything to do with your life? Jeez. But, uh, maybe that's what my kids will do when I'm just like, look, here, this one's 2011. What, don't you care? Um, But I get the feeling that they will still care. And... Even if they don't, there'll be others. There'll be their children that'll be like, wow, got a book of 2011? Let me see it. Okay, listen, ladies. It's unfortunately big as taken, but this is going to warm the cockles of your heart. Whoa, hey, but we can't use that kind of language on the show. For years and years, for each one of his children's birthdays, Big would make a video <laughs> where he would take footage of them from that year and put a song over it just edit it all together and then give it to the kid to watch. And it's like, this is your fifth birthday video or whatever of you when you were four. I know that he would do it just for fun or whatever, but I was like, oh my gosh, that's the coolest friggin' thing. And you know, those guys are going to be like 25 or 18 or 10 and watching those and just being like, oh, my dead dad was so cool. <laughs> and they're going to have memories of of the times that they wouldn't otherwise remember without seeing it in front of their eyes. They'll have nostalgia for the Evan and Jerem song or whatever it was that they, they, you know, that's long, long forgotten and they would never otherwise know. Anyhow, that's something that I was always super jealous of you about. Not that you had kids, but that you made videos about <laughs> your kids. The funny thing is that they're actually that way. You know, we took a lot of video of them. So, you know, I may not have written blog posts about them when they were little, but I took as much video as possible to the point where my wife is sometimes like, it's time to cut and go on to the next scene here. Holy crap, this is boring. But yeah, I would do that. And I think that came from our documentary professor when we were in college where he would say, you know, it's important to just shoot a lot. You got to let things happen. If you don't shoot for a while, then you'll miss things and he showed us the most amazing home video of his kid you know he just videotaped his kid sitting in the high chair eating food and dancing to some song that he put on and stuff like that and then the kid puts a banana in her mouth and then turns and smiles and the banana like makes her mouth that much bigger because she stuffed the whole thing in there and you get that awesome shot that would be a youtube hit right now would have like five million hits on YouTube if this video was on there, which for that matter, it may be by now, didn't exist back then. Yeah, he always talked about how you had to let things happen. You had to let them breathe. You had to shoot long enough to be able to get the stuff. And so I always did that with my kids. I would turn on the camera and let them play and I would just film them play just because I thought, you know, 10, 15 years from now, they're not going to remember what they were like when they were three or four or know what it was like to be three or four. And so if they can see enough of themselves doing these things, then they can actually get an idea. Instead of just seeing, oh, here's a shot, here's a shot, here's a shot kind of a thing, they actually get to live 10 or 15 minutes of their life from that. My kids, they love to watch these home videos and, you know, whenever I throw them on for them, they sit down and they'll just watch them and then they'll get all addicted and they'll watch them for like two or three days straight. They'll just watch like hours of video Okay, it's not cute anymore. <laughs> but the the funny thing is, like, they'll remember things because I caught them on tape. They wouldn't remember it otherwise, and they remember really seeing it, you know. But the, the fact that it happened, and then a year later they saw it, so it kept it in their memory. And then, you know, a year later or whatever, they saw it again, and so it remains in their memory, and they never actually lost the memory because they keep getting reminded of it because it was on tape. 
I always thought that was interesting. You know, they'll say, oh, yeah, totally remember when this happened. And I think in my head, you don't remember when that happened. You remember it because you saw the video of when it happened. But But it doesn't matter. They have that memory, which is cool. Yeah. And yeah, there were things that I did when I was three or two that I still remember because my grandma wouldn't stop telling the story. (laughs) But thank goodness that she did because she's gone now. And I still remember that experience from before my memories begin. Right. And sometimes, you know, I'll have vague memories too. I'll be like, oh yeah. And I'll ask my dad, tell me how that went again. What was the story where I did this or where this happened or whatever? And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll have to be refreshed on the story so that I can remember them again. Um, There was a time once where I actually, I took my dad, this was back when I was in film school again. I had this idea to do a documentary, a biography type thing about my dad. And so I grabbed all this camera gear and I sat my dad down and I made him tell the story of his life and I uh, got it on tape. I still haven't made that biography video, but I have all the tapes where he tells all the stories. So if nothing else, I've got the story. We know it. We can hear it. We can see it and we can see him telling it. And, uh, you know, those kind of things are valuable too. just getting people to tell stories while they're still around. Like you say, your grandma's not around anymore. But you can remember things because she told you the stories. You'd remember them even better if you had a video of her telling those stories that you could refer back to again and again. It's a really interesting and fun thing. It's funny because I wrote a story last year. I don't believe you. It was the anti, it was the cursed version of this where... uh, Ghosts can't pass on from out of uh, the realm until everybody forgets about them. And so the poor people who have photos taken of them or... Like Mona Lisa. Videos of them. Yeah, Mona Lisa was one that I did mention in the story. They're stuck and they can't pass on. Maybe this isn't a good thing if that's really how the world goes, but I'm pretty sure it's not. So uh, I think your ghost will be free even if people remember you. So uh, I think it's worthwhile. One way to find out. Uh, I think it's time for you to leave. Mm. (laughs) It's interesting how this turned into a discussion of that kind of stuff. But that is somewhat of an obsession, I guess, of mine is, I guess, documenting life. It must be the documentary class still hiding within me or something like that. Despite the fact that I didn't even get a good grade in that class and the teacher thought I was an idiot. He was a wise man. Yeah, he knew best. Rish, you've become a half-human, half-monster abomination. Um, Before we go, all December and part of January, we had our Broken Mirror story event going on. That is, of course, now over. Uh, Nothing is over! (laughs) Nothing! If you didn't write your story yet, you're a little too late. Maybe you can see if somebody else wants it. We don't want your story. We don't want any stories. Submissions are closed. That's right. Submissions are closed, and they'll probably remain closed until we get the whole Broken Mirror story thing taken care of, and that's probably about when we'll open them back up. There were, what, 14? There was, yeah, at least 14 entries to this contest, and yeah, I'm pretty excited to read them. We, As we record this, we closed the, the contest up like a few days ago, so we haven't even read a single story yet. But uh, I'm pretty excited to read them and to see, you know, how people took that uh, prompt that we gave them, what they did with it, uh, if anybody did something similar to mine or what. So I guess we'll we'll find out. And, yeah, we'll be getting them ready for you. And you can look forward to the Broken Mirror Story event episodes down the line. I don't know how many there's going to be, if we're going to do lots of stories, if we'll cram them into one episode or do several episodes of it or what. If you'd like to produce one of these Broken Mirror episodes, <laughs> let us know. Yeah, we'd be happy to let you do our work for us. <laughs> so, uh, look forward to that. So, February is almost here. Oh, hey, don't remind me. It's the um, shortest month. It is just barely this year, though, because it's a leap year. You are. So, it's only one day shorter instead of two. Well, I'm not fond of February, as you know. I'm not sure if there's any way that you could make me fond of it. Probably not. Angela Lansbury might be able to make me fond of it, but you know. There is that. Angela Lansbury's just got that special something that everybody loves. 
Neither one prepared. I got it backwards, didn't I? Both a little scared. Uh, anyways, I think since you love February so much, you wanted to do something special to really ring in the new Chinese New Year. To, <laughs> to really make it better than any other February there's ever been. Why don't you explain to the folks listening at home just what exactly that is, Rashoutfield? Okay, well, I found out that there's a red light district in my town, and I've been saving my 20s. And that could have been good, but it sure wasn't. And uh, I, I bought a van. Yeah. Where you can take out the middle seat. Oh, does it have a wizard painted on the side? It's got flounder from the Little Mermaid painted oh, on the side. I, awesome. It was on sale. <laughs> so you're not going to explain to the folks at home then, huh? I think it initially was supposed to be some kind of money-making enterprise, and I'm just too embarrassed to to say it now. So why don't you share it with folks? Yeah, it was supposed to be a, a donation getter. So please donate if you'd like to. What They won't. Don't worry. Well, our, this is the same episode we announced another incentive episode. So, uh, so they definitely won't. The idea was that we would do something. It, it's like a nano rimo, but for Dune Steve podcasting. That's right. Somebody on Facebook. That's what it was. Somebody on Facebook. I think in December it was like December sixth or seventh. Said, "How are you guys doing on Daily Podcasting Month?" Because I guess I'm part of a podcasting community on Facebook. And I was like, month? What, what? What is this? And I was like, oh, didn't you know? Everybody's supposed to podcast every single day in December. I was like, oh, if I had a podcast, I guess I would have done that. Oh, I hadn't saved the date, so I didn't know. Oh, wow. That one was an air ball. Since Rish is always the, uh, the underachiever, he decided, I'm not going to do a 31-day month podcasting, but maybe we could do a... 28 day month unbeknownst to him it was actually a leap year and became a 29 day month so twice the amount of work that we would have gone through but yes coming up here in february you will have the dune steef podcast recording month we are going to release a podcast every day of february until our demands are met yeah, so it'll be <laughs> doubly hard. Doesn't it sound them. like some kind of threat? And it's like, we're going to shoot a hostage every hour on the hour until. <laughs> so, yeah, if you're uh, if you're hip with that jive, you can check it out. It's going to be coming out on the That Gets My Goat feed. We're about to double the amount of episodes we've got on the That Gets My Goat feed because by the end of this month, there will be 29 more Unless, of course, I quit halfway through, which is very likely. That's, I guess, possible. <sighs> I, I'm not sure why we're even mentioning this, because nobody listens to that gets my goat. There is that. Which is fine. Anyways, listen to Dupo Remo, everybody. That's what it's called. Have fun. They, they won't do it. You're giving sign language to the blind. So, hey, thank you, Joseph, for sending us this story. Thank you, Ken Crawford, for your many hours of redoing many hours of work on it <laughs> and then i guess we have one other thing that we wanted to tell people right yeah we just finished before we started recording this the episode half of our next incentive episode an incentive episode is an episode of the show with a story and conversation afterward that is only available to people who donate to the show that's how we pay for the stories that we run on the show, that's how we pay to have a podcast, to have a website, to have storage for the podcast uh, available out there on yeah, the web. Have them online. We have to pay for that. If you would like to donate to the show, there's a button right there on the main page on doonsteef.com. You can pay us via PayPal. Even better, you could subscribe to the show, which just means that you pay us $5 a month or $5 a quarter. Just something that we really need and in return we will punish you with an insanely <laughs> long episode of our show even longer than this one a story called you've got a friend inspired by the james taylor song not the randy newman song but it could go either way if, if, if you prefer the randy newman song that's fine yeah, You've Got a Friend is a story written by our very own 
announcer man. Not on your life. Oh, I'm just an announcer. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, it, written by our very own Rish Outfield. And it was inspired by some antics in our... <laughs> the main character is even kind of modeled after me. And uh, you can find out all about it if you listen to the incentive episode. Because the whole post-story chatter is like one super long author's note. We talk about where the story came from and why it was done and the way it was. This is this is a third incentive episode that we've done. That's right. Easily the most ambitious one. And and maybe I shouldn't say ambitious, but the most work. It's a super, super long story. And it had vocal effects that took forever. I remember it would take me like half an hour to do like a minute and a half of this friggin' story. <laughs> Once we got to a certain point and tedious is all, oh, no, I won't tell people that. <laughs> Enthralling, really, from beginning to end. But uh, it's you and me doing voices. We got Rich Girardi to do a voice. It's yeah, okay. it's Rich, Rich Girardi's swan song because he's retired from our show. So uh, it's probably your last chance to hear Rich Girardi's voice, which I'm sure you love because it's very melodious, <laughs> and characteristic. And Rich does a great job with it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's like the, the album that you get from that uh, band that they're done with music. And then all of a sudden the B-sides or whatever comes out like four or five or ten years later. Unreleased material. I believe Tupac has about 20 albums yeah. like that. Yeah, Tupac, lots of, lots of bands like that. Although Rich is not dead. Oh. You don't need to worry about that. But maybe we can coax him back out of retirement. But uh, for now, it's your last chance to hear Rich. And uh, yeah, he does a great job pretending to be drunk at one point. Good stuff. So yeah, if you're interested in hearing, if you like Rich Outfield, and I'm, I'm sure there must be somebody out there that does. Uh, don't be so sure, laddie. <laughs> Throw a couple bucks in the old Dune Steve coffers and we will send this episode your way. And you can listen to it at your leisure. Also, if it's a big hit and a lot of people buy it ostensibly, that may inspire Big to do one of his own. You never know. Yeah, so, I, I did let us do one of my stories last time around. And so if it seems worthwhile, maybe we'll do a fourth incentive episode and you guys can hear more stuff from us because our stuff doesn't make it on the show very often. We have put it on the show some, but along those lines, you and I have a friend in common, Ian. And when we told him we were having a podcast, what was the one thing, the bit of advice he gave us about a podcast? I think he said, if we're not doing stories that we wrote, then we're wasting his time. Or maybe it was, we're wasting our time. Yeah, he said that. And I was just like, but you know, people are, are submitting stories. We've got these. And he's just like, no, I'm done. <laughs> and so in memory of Ian... <laughs> yeah, you can get one of our stories. Maybe someday we'll just cut the whole thing off and it'll just be our stories week after week after week. Don't you dare go there. It's never going to happen because <laughs> I I never let anyone read my stories. Do you know why? Maybe they'll say you're no good. Maybe they'll say you got no future, kid. I don't think. <laughs> Finish it with me, folks. I could I handle, could handle that, that kind, kind of, of rejection. rejection. And on that note, I have been Rich Outfield. And I've been being Anklevich. Good night. And why not? I don't know. It's a good question. It really is. Every time. It, it doesn't really demand an answer. It just, it, you're supposed to think about oh, it. Well, it never gets old. At least you can say that about it. The Dune Steep Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. I press the button. Take two. And then I guess we have one other thing that we wanted to tell people, right? Do we want to talk about? You've yeah. About what? You've got a friend. Oh, they you said your girlfriend. <laughs> it's like, uh, what so about her? A girlfriend who loved sex. <laughs> and the way I know this is. Uh, oh, save that up just for you. Gross.
Welcome to the show.